So let's restart the class. So then let's just ask some questions to check our understanding. The first question is, why is more money more valuable today than in the future? So discuss with your partner. <laughs> Fisher made this idea of the real interest rate. What is the real interest rate and how can we estimate it? Okay, 
So, uh, who can tell me the answer to the first question? What's one? Yes. Answer is people's patience. Yes. And uncertainty. Yes. And inflation. Okay. And what about the second question? What is the real interest rate? Inflation, right? But what is it? That's how we calculate it. Nominal interest rate minus inflation, right? What is the what is it? According to Irvine Fisher, what we can use the to estimate it, we can also use the tips, right? We can find the nominal one and we can find the IMF estimate for inflation and we can take it away, right? Or we can find the market rate by looking at the tips, right? <coughs> what is the real interest rate, according to Irvine Fisher? Why do we have a real interest rate? It is known as inflation. Hmm? Your interest to... Why isn't it, for a US government bond, why isn't the interest rate the same as inflation? Yes, so people's preference, right? Patience and preference, basically. You understand patience? Channel song? Channel song manayo? Channel song manchi anayo? Yoja do channel song manayo? Namja do channel song opsak? Majayo? Chodo tukete? YouTube Patience. So we can say that uh, some people are more patient than other people, but the average of people's patience, investors' patience in the world, is the real interest rate. Okay? The so real interest rate changes over time. Depends. We had we, we had a, a negative realist interest rate in the past, right? In the time of crisis, okay. people will want to put their money in the safe asset like U.S. government bonds. Okay, they don't. It's time of crisis, so they don't they don't uh, expect to get much. So. <coughs> Other people have different ideas about the interest rate. Do you know Karl Marx? Yes, yes. His idea about the interest rate was that the, it was basically a fight between the workers and the bosses, the capitalists. So the workers work for the bosses, right? And the bosses make a profit. So he said if the workers fight for higher wages, then the boss's profit is less and the interest rate will be lower. But if there's a big difference between the workers' wages, right, and the, the boss makes a big profit, then the interest rate will be quite high. But this is a wrong idea, right? Yes. This idea is, doesn't make sense. Irvine Fisher made the right idea about the interest rate, okay? So we have different people had different ideas about the interest rate, but now widely accepted is Irvine Fisher's, right? So, uh, this idea of patience. So, <coughs> so, so, a couple of people asked me questions again about the, the bonds. Just, we were looking at the bonds, so we might as well explain it. Again, it can be confusing the first time that you see it. Uh, we see here coupon and price. So let's take the US 10-year bond, right? We can see here it is 10-year. We can see that it has a coupon of 2. Well, you can see the coupon is an even number usually. 6, 0 0.625, 1.375, right? This is decided at the start when we make the bond. We can make a zero coupon bond. It has no coupon. Usually the short-term bond, we're not going to pay interest. Anyway, you're going to get your money back in three months, in six months, in 12 months, okay? So we're not going to give you any coupon. 
The reason they don't say interest is it's confusing to say interest because the yield is more like the interest. So they say coupon, right? So they, they're going to give you here, on the two-year bond, they'll give you this much every year of your money, right? Like an interest payment. On the five-year, they'll give you this. On the 10-year, they'll give you this. It's a flat number, two, two percent, okay? And you have to decide how much you're going to pay for the bond. So we can see all of these values are below 100. This is the price, price of the bond, okay? So we say that the face value is 100. So the price, this would be, if the value is 1 million, this would be 998,000, okay? If the price is 100, this is going to be 99.6. Here it's 98.7. Then we need to do a calculation to find the yield. Okay, here I did an example calculation. Okay, this is a, maybe why people don't understand. Okay, now I have hundred dollars. Okay, the interest rate is ten percent. How much is hundred dollars in one year worth today? Right. So let's say we have. <coughs> sorry, we get hundred dollars next year. Right. How much is that worth in today's money? Is that worth hundred dollars in today's money? No, it's not, right? How much is it worth? What do we need to know? We need to know the, the interest rate, right? Interest rate is 10%. 10% is 0 0.1. So we put 100 over 1 plus 0 0.1. That's the equation. So 100 over 1.1. The answer is going to be around 90. Does that make sense? Yeah. If the interest rate is 10%, $100 next year is worth $90 today. Does that make sense yes. to you? Yes, you could put the $90 in the bank, you'll get 10% interest rate of 99, right? So I'm doing roughly, it's going to be 90 point something, 90 point blah blah blah, okay? <coughs> so then, if we, what we're doing here is we're finding, solving this equation for R, okay? So in this case, we know that in the bond, we're going to get back a million dollars or hundred dollars, right? the end of 10 years, or the end of the year. We know the price of the bond today. I wrote 90 here. Here it's 99.8, 98.7, right? So we have to find what R is. So we put R into the equation, one plus R. This is our yield, okay? So we have to solve this, and we'll find our yield. <coughs> so we get 100 equals 90 times one plus R. 100 equals 90 plus 90 R. Okay, then we put this 90 across, it's going to be 10. Okay, 10 equals 90 R. R is equals to 1 over 9. R is equals to 0 0.1, right? Back to where we started. So we do this equation for this. Okay, it's a simple equation if we have zero comp coupon. It's going to be like this. Okay, but if we have this it's going to be a more complicated equation. We have to take into account the coupon too. Okay? And in the end, we'll get this number, the yield, which is in fact or or the return or the interest rate I'm going to make. Okay? So that's the difference between the coupon, the price, and the yield. So which is the most important number? Coupon price or yield? Yield. Okay, so people don't worry, don't worry about this, right? I'm just a, somebody asking a question, so I'm explaining it to you. Okay? Somebody else will do the calculation. The important thing is the yield. Okay? The yield is practically how much money I will get okay? at, at the end of each year. So you can treat the yield like the interest rate on the bond. Okay? Do you have any more questions about that? So it's more simple on zero coupon bond, right? So it, uh, mm. it is related to um, interest rate. What is related to interest rate? Uh, yield is related to Yes. If you think about interest, if you put money in the bank and you get interest every year, right? Two <coughs> percent or three percent, then that's what you can compare the yield to. Okay? Because you're getting two percent interest for the coupon, right? But you have to remember that you didn't put a million dollars in the bank. You only put $980 in the bank, okay? So at the end, you're not going to get back 980. You're going to get back more. 
than 980. So your interest rate is not going to be 2% a year. It's going to be slightly more than 2% a year. Okay? So we have to do a complicated calculation. This is just if it's zero coupon, we can do a fairly simple calculation. But if we are going to put in a coupon, it's going to be a complicated calculation, okay? That we don't need to do here. Just we need to understand that we do a complicated calculation and we find out this important number. Right? This important number is the return I get every year on a yearly basis, annual basis. I make it 2.14% return. Okay? Anyway, it helps. We see these things here, so it helps to understand them. That's how the bond is sold. It's sold for this price. People go away and calculate the yield. <clears throat> so it's good to ask questions because other people, I'm sure, have the same question. Okay. Uh, then let's move on to talk about diversification. Have you heard of diversification before? Da Yong Hua? Is that correct? Hmm? What is Da Yong Hua? I made a mistake. I shouldn't speak Korean in class. <laughs> I'll, I'll confuse people. Hmm? What does Da Yong Hua mean? Portfolio. Da Hakwa. Gakwa. Da Gakwa. Okay, thank you. Pointing the diversification. So, can you explain what does diversification mean? Can anybody tell me what does that mean? Invest the money in every industry. Many industries. Yes. Then what? Just not one industry. <coughs> then what will happen? It is high risk. Higher risk. Higher risk by diversification or lower risk? Lower risk. Lower risk. Right? So let's explain that simply. I invest in the stock. You understand stock, Chushik? Stock A and stock B. Okay? Stock A price now is 100. Stock B's price now is 50. Okay? Next year. Stock A's price goes down to 80. Stock B's price goes, stays the same at 50. Okay? So I invest only in stock A. How much percent did I lose? Minus 20 percent. Okay? I invest in stock A and stock B. How much did I lose? Percent. So I have 100. It would be 150, 130, right? Mm -hmm. So what? It will be lower than 20 percent. Okay. How much can anybody do? Tell me exactly. Do you have a calculator? Mm -hmm. I had 150. Now I have 130. So the way we usually do this is the first price minus second price, right? Over. The first price. So it's going to be uh, the first price is going to be 150 minus 130 over first price 150. So what percent is that? We're going to have 20 over 150 equals. 2 over 15. So this one was 20 over 100. This one is 20 over 150. So it should be, you said what? 13. About 13 percent. Okay. So in the first case, we lost. 20%. In the second case, we lost 13%. Okay, why we invest in both stock A and B? So that's the idea of diversification. So 
Uh, I invest just in one stock. I can lose everything, right? I invest in the two stocks. I lose less. But you have to understand, it's also less return. Okay? Less risk, but also less return. If it was the opposite, this one went up, 120, right? Then I'm going to make plus 20%, okay? And then uh, this one will be 150 minus 170 over 150, so this one will be just plus 13%, okay? So, uh, diversification reduced the risk, basically, but also reduced the return. Now, there's a mathematical equation which proves this, which we're not going to go into, but you can go into statistics and so on, right, and make the mathematical equation. But, but this has been understood for thousands of years, okay? So even when traders in ancient Greece, the water was very bad in ancient Greece, right? Here is Greece, and here is Italy. So to go from Greece to Italy in the old days, there's some islands, it was very hard to do, right, with the old ships. So they, they went different ways. Why did they go different ways, instead of the ships all going the same way? Say I have, I'm, I'm selling wine from Greece to Italy, right? So I send half my wine this way, and I send half my wine on the ship this way. Why, why did they do that? Yes, what risk? Yes, there's a storm or the ship sinks. If I send every, half my wine here and half my wine here, right? And there's no storm, fine, all my wine gets there, okay? Maybe there's some extra transaction cost. It was a little bit more expensive to send them separately, right? But if, I, if there's a storm here, I lose half my wine, right? Well, I could have lost all my wine. If I sent all my wine here and there's a storm, the ship sinks, I lose all my wine. Okay? So people have understood that for a long time. That's another thing we need to understand in finance, that if we diversify, we make a lower risk situation. We say this in English, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Do you have a saying like that in your language? What, how did it, can you translate into English? Exactly. Exactly the same? Yes. So in the bicycle, you have the, just it means you have the front, I'm very good at art, I got always A plus at art, as you can see. <laughs> basket at the front and basket at the back. So if the bicycle crashes this way, all the eggs fall out, right? <laughs> you lose all your eggs. But if you put your eggs in the basket at the front and the basket at the back, then it might be okay. You have half, at least you have half of your eggs. Do you have a saying like this in Korean? Can you say it loudly? The same one about eggs in the basket? Yes. Really? Okay. So, do you have any questions about diversification? If you want to get a high, very high return, should you diversify? <coughs> if you want to have a safe investment, should you diversify? Yes. yes. Pension, if you're running a pension fund, are you going to put all of the pensioners' money into his company? <laughs> A startup company, it would be great for the pensioners. They'll have a lot of money. They can all go on cruises to Turkey because his company will make so much money. No? No. Right? You lose all their money, the poor pensioners won't have enough money, right? So, pension fund will use diversification to cut down their risk. Okay? So, <coughs> These days you can find some funds like exchange traded funds, like S&P 500, you can buy top 500 stocks in the US, right? Just buy the fund and you can buy the top 500 stocks together, it's quite diversified. Okay. Uh, then let's talk about the next part of theory.
just we're going through financial theory, okay? That we should understand at the start of the course. Uh, the next one is efficient markets. Has anybody heard of efficient market theory before? Yes. Yes. Can you tell us what it means? Low performance action. Supply and demand is appropriate. Mm -hmm. So the government shouldn't interfere, just we use the market's oh, supply and demand forces, right? Then what? Our investors mm -hmm. can reasonably for the profit. Mm -hmm. And our information or market is Investors clear. act reasonably, right? Yeah. Do you understand reasonably? Maybe a better word is rationally. Yes. Do you understand rationale? Yes. Mm -hmm. When I do to horse races, and I see just one horse has green color, jockey. I'm from Ireland, so I'm going to bet on that horse. It has a green color. Is that rational? No. Does the color make any difference to the performance of the horse? No. No, right? That's not rational judgment. Are all investors rational? No. No, right? But this theory says if all investors are rational, yes? Other part of the theory? If our information or market is clear to investors. Information is, is available and clear, right? Yeah, available. So everybody has the information. <coughs> so an example where I don't have the information <coughs> is I go to the horse racing and uh, one of the horses is injured. Do you understand injured? Yes. That trust sale, <laughs> right? But they don't tell me. They just tell their friends, not me. Okay? Do I have all the information to bet on the race? No. No, that's not available. Information is not available to everyone. Okay? In that case. So, is the same information always available to everybody in the stock market? or in the markets? No, okay, again it's a theory. You get that problem in the stock market too, <coughs> some insider trading, somebody tells before the, it happens, right? The company found some gold, right? Then they have, the company are supposed to wait until it's publicly announced that they found gold, right? But maybe they ring their friend and they say, hey, we found some gold, get ready to buy the stock, right? Don't tell anybody, okay? And they cut the line very fine because when they go to the office and they make the public announcement to the press, as soon as they make the public announcement, run to the phone, right? <laughs> tell their friend while they're making the public announcement, right? We found gold, buy the stock, okay? So anyway, this idea that information is available to everyone, okay? Anything else? Right? We don't we don't have any interference from outside from the government, right? You said no interference from the government. In China, is the Chinese government interfering in the market? In the stock market? Yes. Yes. Crash? Yes, right? So a lot of people who believe in the efficient market theory, they would say Chinese government shouldn't be interfering. They're just making things worse, right? They're saying that anyway, it doesn't matter if the Chinese government tries to interfere. Anyway, the price is going to go down in the end, right? Whether it happens today or two months later or three months later. Okay? So if we have these three things, then if it, people say that markets are efficient, what does efficient mean? It means they work well. Work well, right? Everything goes well. The price is correct, right? There shouldn't be big up and downs, okay? Does that happen in the real life? No, right? So this is theory and this word for this is Pareto efficient. It means that the markets work very well, buyers and sellers get the best deal, right? Markets are generally a positive thing. There's no monopolies. Do you understand monopoly? Yes. 
there's a free competition, so the government shouldn't interfere, right? But we have some psychological arguments against this. Can you tell me some psychological arguments which we have against efficient markets? People don't act rationally. Just when I go to the horse races, I don't, I don't pick the horse because of the performance, right? I pick because of the color, for some reason like that. Okay? So people are irrational. We, we also have another one which is called herding. What does herding mean? It's a big problem in markets. Do you know what a herd is? A herd of buffalo, or a herd of cows, or a herd of sheep? Hmm? I think we can find on Google Images, it will explain the best. Why are all the buffaloes going off the cliff? Why are they jumping off the cliff? They're just following the leader blindly. Following the other people blindly, right? That's a herd. A herd is a group of animals. Okay? So a group of animals are not that smart. Are people smarter than animals? Yes, but they use this vocabulary for people too. If he jumps off the cliff, are you going to jump after him? No. <laughs> Like that? Hmm? No. no, so you're smarter than animals, right? Yeah. But if he buys the stock, are you going to buy the stock too? Are you sure? You're not going to think about it, just he bought the stock, so I'm going to buy too. Hmm? So we can see this problem especially in the real estate market. Okay? He bought a house. He goes to your party and he says, Oh, I bought a house last week. Yes. <laughs> Very nice house, yes. Price went up 10% last month. Why don't you buy a house? Then you feel bad, right? You go home. <laughs> Tell your mother. Your mother says, Why don't you buy a house? <laughs> he bought a house. It's a very nice house. Price went up 10% last month. What about you? Are you going to buy a house? <laughs> don't think so? Okay then, maybe you're, you hold out for one or two months. Three months later, the price is up 30%. Everybody's telling you. At the party. <laughs> what? You didn't buy a house yet? I bought an investment property in the countryside, right? Finally, you might lose control, right? You might say, get excited and say, oh, look at all my friends made a big profit on their house, so I'm going to buy a house too. Then one week later, property market crash. <laughs> right? If this was him, right? You were following him along, thinking, I'm going to some new nice field to eat some nice grass, and then suddenly he falls off the cliff and you follow him, right? So this is called herding. So they've done some research on this. The main person who does research on psychology, his name is Robert, Robert Schiller. From Yale University, and you can you can uh, get some online. He has an online course on financial markets, free online course. So if you type financial markets and Yale into the internet, you can find his course. Okay, if you want to study about financial markets more. Well, he went to Wall Street when there was a crash. Nowadays, there's a crash in China, right? So he went and he interviewed all the traders. And he asked them, why are you selling your stock? What do you think they said? Because everybody's selling. Yes, they didn't have any rational reason. Well, most of them said, everybody's selling. Why? So I'm selling, because everybody is selling. So they're not thinking, they're not using the information. Okay? They're not looking at the profit of the company. Okay? They're not looking at how the company is doing. And thinking, is it a good investment? Is it a good price? <coughs> Right? They're not looking at things which affect the performance. They're just copying, copying the other people. Okay? So this is the main problem in financial markets, is hurting. And this can cause bubbles and crashes. Okay? So basically, people 
uh, work uh, like animals in a herd sometimes, psychologically. Can you understand why people do that? Hmm? Would you be under pressure to buy a house if all your friends were buying houses and they made a big profit? Hmm? You're not? Okay. What if your mother starts complaining every day? <laughs> hmm? <clears throat> so it was quite funny in Ireland. The property market went up a lot. A lot of people was always talking about their house, how much the price went up last month or last week, right? Very excited. Then there was a big property crash. People never talk about house anymore. <laughs> never hear even one person talking about the property price. Just completely avoid the topic, property prices and houses. Right? In Korea also, they had a kind of property bubble and crash, right? And in the US. So there's other factors, but Robert Schiller believes a lot in psychology. So we have this kind of psychological effect in the market. Now, we'll talk about later in crashes. If the market is okay, it may help sometimes to intervene, just to stop the people from panicking, right? Maybe that's what the Chinese government is trying to do now. But if there is a more fundamental problem in the market, then anyway the market is going to go down, whether you intervene or not. So it's a kind of gray area about intervening in the market or not. So, do you have any questions about efficient markets? No. No? <clears throat> so, next let's talk about marginal utility. So, uh, which do you prefer, water or diamonds? Okay, if you were in a room for two weeks, with nothing at all, <laughs> and I asked you, which would you prefer, water or diamonds? What are you going to say? Which is more valuable? What do you think? Hmm? Depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. Okay, but for your life, if I told you you could have no water or no diamonds, which would be more valuable? Right? But you can get water for free or very cheap. Why? Right? But diamonds is very expensive. Why is that? Hmm? The number of diamonds is very low. The number of water is very high. Okay, so supply and demand. Or marginal utility. Also called marginal utility. Okay, so the marginal utility means the less of something we have, right? then the higher the price it could be, even if it's not useful. That useful, right? Also, people have, some people have more money and they prefer different things or certain things, right? So, some people want to buy diamonds and they have a lot of money, even though it's in the low supply, the price will be high, okay? So we have this idea of supply and demand. So it's a basic idea in economics, right? You increase the supply, is the price going to go up or down? If we increase the demand, what's going to happen to the price? Increase the If we increase demand, what will happen to the price? Going up. Going up. Increase supply, what happens to the price? Down, right? So we can see with money, we talked about inflation, if we increase the supply of money, the value of money goes down, right? So we have inflation and the exchange rate, is going to, the money is going to get weaker, okay? So just that's a basic idea. It sounds like a simple idea, but it can be confusing sometimes, right? Also for the bond price, supply and demand matters. We talked about Switzerland. If there is some kind of crisis, people prefer to buy safe assets, right? People prefer as well, so the demand goes up for the Swiss bond, right? Or the US bond, the demand goes up in the crisis period, okay? Now the 
supply might go up as well of government bonds and then the government bond will be less valuable people will be paying a lower price and the yield will be higher okay so <coughs> let's just check our understanding of these three things with our partner so I'll discuss with your partner what what is the idea of diversification explain with some example Question discuss what is the idea of efficient markets? Efficient markets. What is the idea of efficient markets? idea of marginal utility. Discuss with your partners. So over here, hello, can one of you guys explain diversification? idea of diversification. Thank you. 
videos this through the best um, stock, not all stock. Okay, across various stocks. Okay, then the next question. What about, what is uh, the efficient market idea? Uh, I think the efficient market is every investigator is a large original mind, and original mind, and everyone can compete with each of the companies. Yes. What's the problem with this theory? It's have some psych psychological effect right, on each other, uh, then what is marginal utility? So you two guys up here. Different people have different preferences, so some people want to buy that, even if it's not that useful. Right? And if that's low supply, they'll still pay a very high price. Okay? Uh, of course, the diamond, any industry, they want to create more demand for their product, right? So, diamond industry is always trying to create demand for their product. So, uh, does anybody have any question about what we studied today? Calculate the majority. Anybody calculate the majority between two? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Somebody calculate the other people's want more this. You mean people calculate? Mm. Mm, I'm sorry, but I don't understand what you mean. Mm. 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 Possible? Can you possible marginal utility? Other people? Other people? Other people's marginal utility be possible? Marginal utility mathematically. You can make a graph and you can look at the part of the graph and the size of the graph, but prices, price and supply and demand is changing. Yes, but you can make some calculations in that area using graph. Okay. Any more question? Okay then, so we can see on the website uh, here <coughs> we have this, this is the classroom today and this is all of the PPT files, okay? So this is the website. Also I put up the video if you want, if there was something you want to check again, right? Yeah. Then look at the video.